Why do we have to clean mould every other week in New Zealand? We've got energy ratings for our appliances. We've got safety ratings for our cars. It's the middle of winter, Aotearoa, and we have to open our windows and doors for ventilation. And see my breath when I wake up. Here, here's a roof, there ain't no insulation. Welcome to New Zealand. We started off with one question. Is it possible to have healthy homes in Aotearoa? Because it hasn't been for the last 40 years. We've been up and down the country. We've been in and out of more homes than I ever thought I would be. All in the quest to answer that one question. Are we any closer? I think we might be. Today, we're gonna to go have a look at a company that is building passive house to scale and Kiwi Ingenuity that's gonna help potentially take our 1.8 million unhealthy homes and make them healthy. When we started this journey, one of the things I was really aware of was how do we communicate to you and also for my purposes, what healthy looks like. Without data, it's really difficult because the language that most of the professionals use is not language that I understand. And so we put tether sensors into all of the houses, whether they be considered healthy, unhealthy, Homestar, six, seven, 10, passive, we put sensors into all because somebody might be telling me this house is healthy, but I wanna be able to know for sure. Brandon, the tether sensors that we've had in the homes for this series have been invaluable. When you look at the data, is that what you're expecting to see? Absolutely, it's undeniable that all the asthma New Zealand homes in the series, between the high performing homes and the code standard homes, the high performing homes perform way better than the code standard homes. In a lot of cases, the code standard homes are actually unhealthy. And I think for all the viewers, just remember a code home is what most of us live in because that sets the benchmark for what builders build to in Aotearoa. And what we're pushing for is that code needs to be lifted. It needs to be lifted to a standard whereby health is not a luxury, it is just a given. So many people have talked about this thing called passive house. You and I have looked at what a passive house is. But I want to know, is it possible to build passive house on scale to make it affordable for you and I? Today we're travelling down to Wanganui to have a look at a company that's doing exactly that. Research has felt like an inconvenient truth. New Zealand's been epic. Yeah. We've conducted so much research that says the same thing. Yeah. The homes that we build in this country are not healthy. Then in the too hard basket to actually say, well, what do we do about that? And that's the, that's the perfect storm that we're in right now. Is it even possible for somebody like me to build a high performing house in New Zealand for a budget that actually is achievable. An automatically passive house gets associated with high costs. Yes. And of course there are examples where that is the case. The reality is today we're sitting in a certified passive house that has not cost the earth to build. The more complexity we build into a home, the more materials it will take and the more time it will take to build. But in New Zealand, we're still captured that big is beautiful and I need to build the biggest house I can possibly afford. What we're saying as a company is let's actually think really carefully about those spaces, create spaces that are functional, that are going to work well for your family. But the things that can never change, those are the things that we get right from the beginning. The other incredible thing is when you get that fabric of the building right, then the running costs and the health of the home is outstanding. This home, for example, runs for the last five years an average of $83 a month. And that's the total running costs. $83 a month, including a month. GST to run the home. Let's just say, for example, it's $250 saving on average. The amount of impact that makes on the mortgage if you've borrowed money is phenomenal. 
but right now in New Zealand there's no requirement to talk about the consumption of energy for a home or a building, any building that's been built. It seems absolutely astounding to me. And it's not just about energy, it's about safety ratings. And yet there is no recognition in New Zealand for energy rating or safety rating for the homes of which we spend 69% of our time in. We've put it in the too hard basket. Is it the, too hard? It's definitely not too hard. The, the knowledge, the building science is all there. There's no research that's required. All of the information is readily available right here, right now for New Zealand because science is not a New Zealand thing. Science is science. It doesn't matter where you travel around the world, the same formulas will work across all continents. But no, this is New Zealand, remember. New Zealand is special. Is that so, or is that a red herring? It's a complete red herring. New Zealand is special in the fact that we're ignoring building science that is commonly used in other countries and mandated. Is it possible to produce a passive house in volume? Absolutely. So what we've been doing at eHouse for the last two years is developing a product that we believe suits many, many Kiwis. Not perfect for everybody, but as many people as possible. And it's called the People's House. And so what we've done is we've stripped out everything that's not delivering the performance that we need, creating the best value proposition. We've actually managed to reduce 88% of the energy running costs compared to a normal brand new home. Wow. And wanting to make that accessible for as many Kiwis as possible. The key is actually making the truth so obvious that people recognise we can't continue to do what we've always been doing. And programmes like this give that opportunity for those things to be revealed to everybody. How long have you been building? Um, been building e-houses now for the last eight years. Because you're managing a team of builders that have probably built, like yourself, code minimum. What is their experience when they start building high performance houses? They're really impressed. Once they can feel it and touch it and, and experience it, they buy into it. They shift, I suppose, their mentality towards what can be achieved and our builders are more than capable of building these houses. Is there a significant change in process and practice building to high performance versus to code? It's process driven just like the rest of our building industry is. It's a stepped process and focusing on your attention to detail which a lot of builders do in their day-to-day -day practice anyway mm. so it's just learning that there's new processes out there and new ways which in an evolving industry like ours, it's, it's, it's a natural step change. Well, home group builders are building to process all the time. Correct. It begs to be asked, well, why wouldn't you just group home build to a high performance? Mass production of it is, is definitely achievable. So if you were to look at the way you build today, are you building differently today than you were 10 years ago? 100%, yeah, completely different. It's the passive principles uh, with air tightness, the insulation and the filtration system and how they all work together. Could you ever build a house to code again? I'd struggle, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a frustrating thing where people will just build to code and that's a minimum standard. We can do far better than that. Like, why, why just focus on a minimum standard? What are some of the biggest differences between this house and a code minimum house? I think a lot of people can't get their head around how could you ever keep a house at a constant 20 degrees. You could never do that on a code minimum. The insulation levels just aren't there. When the valuer came in and he said, oh, where's the heating source? And I said, it doesn't have one. He said, you're crazy, you're in Tower Park, you need a heating source. I said, it doesn't need one. Yeah, but I still don't think he believes me. So today has shown that it is possible to build passive houses on scale so that our future generations get left 
assets rather than what we've been leaving them for the last 50 years is liabilities. And more importantly, there's people doing it, not just talking about it. You and I have the ability to live in a house that is affordable and keeps us healthy. probably can relate to this. I've got a grandma that's living in a home and she does not want to leave it. She's been in there since the 50s. It's a weatherboard home, typical of a Kiwi home, but it is cold and it is certainly super unhealthy. Is it possible for us to do something to this home to make it healthy so that my grandma can stay in this home for as long as possible? So we've been invited to go and have a look at this innovation. Apparently, it is very affordable and even better, my grandmother wouldn't even need to move out of her home while it's being done. St. John, my grandmother, bless her, is living in the house that my mum grew up in. I really want to improve the house because it is freezing. She doesn't have the money to run the heat pumps to the degree that she right. needs to keep this house healthy. Is it possible for us to improve the health of this house from the outside? So yes, um, my research over the past two years has looked at taking some of the best knowledge that we have from around the world uh, with external insulation. And I've looked at how to put that onto existing walls. But what you're doing is you're working from the outside on the outside with new layers of product. So it's kind of like putting a Parker, in fact, the research has been called the Parker Wrap. So the option all of us have is to put another jersey on inside. And instead of us individually putting on another jersey, we put a Parker around the whole building. So an insulated jacket around the outside of the building. John, when you started with this experiment, what in your heart of hearts did you want to prove? It started with social housing. It started with the need to improve uh, buildings for people who couldn't improve them for themselves. And it was targeting a specific type of building, so the Kainga Ora star block. And what I realized was improving those buildings was very, very specific. I changed the direction of it a little bit and I said, well, what about all occupied buildings. Why? Because the cost of disruption for people is huge. Mm. It's the social cost. This is an opportunity to improve buildings without moving people out, without that disruption. John, one of the biggest issues that we have with this house that my grandmother's living in is that she cannot afford the power bills to keep it warm. You know, so by putting this parker over this house. Will she be able to keep her house warm and pay her power bill? A whole bunch of work around this has shown that by putting the parker around the building, you've improved the walls so much from where they were that the, the energy demand, the amount of you know, what you need mm. is reduced by two thirds. Wow, so a $300 a month power bill would come down to $100? That's right. If the wind is whistling through your weatherboard wall, you're losing all of the heat that you put in. That's why it's not comfortable. And we're stopping that. By putting a park around that building, we're stopping that straight away. So John, I feel really excited about the potential of having a solution here. I am aware that we're gonna be making modifications to this house where we're gonna to have to go to council. Yes, you need a council consent. And how easy will that be? It's fairly straightforward because we know what the materials are. They're common materials in our market already. There's nothing radical, there's nothing new. It's just a new position for some of those products on the wall. They've been tested and they've been tested to a recognised standard which councils can rely on to process that consent. And so for them, there will be a lot of reassurance there based on those recognised standards, mm. which then enables them to approve without needing to do their own research. That's right. So John, here we are standing on the outside 
of my grandmother's house, technically speaking. Okay, and I'm looking at the weatherboards here, of which, you know, I've seen as a kid all my life. And so what you're talking about is, do, do you have to rip those off in order to put the parker on the outside? No, well I've deliberately left those on. So the one thing that did come out was the window, but the weatherboards, the existing cladding, doesn't need to be removed. So the house sort of all stays as is, windows change, but the house stays as is. It's partly that whole disruption thing. Why take them off if you don't need to? If they're not falling off, leave them there. And what we're doing is adding layers on the outside. The layers are doing three things really. You've got the first layer there, the blue layer is a weather tight and windproof. So we've stopped the draftiness through the weatherboard wall by doing that. You can't put rain through that product. So that's the first layer that goes on. Right. And then the insulation is next. So we put that on the outside of that blue layer. And again, we're talking about rock wool. If it does get a little bit damp, it doesn't affect the product. The important part is, is that insulation is completely continuous because the next layer is a batten which sits on top of that slab of rock wool. So there are long screws that go through the batten and connect into the framing of the building and then you're hanging the new cladding on the outside of that. Before I engage your services, because you're pretty convincing, how do we know that what you're saying works? That's a good question. Um, what we are looking at is a test wall and we're standing inside a test booth where we can create a storm. We're going to so, create a storm in this. Yeah, we're going to replicate a, a decent storm against this wall and we're going to see where I've unpeeled this. We're going to see water coming through here and then we're going to look at the other part of the wall which is going to be a bit boring because it's working. Can we dial up a one in a hundred year storm thing? We can. Oh good, this is going to get... And what about an earthquake? We should throw an earthquake in because New Zealand's can, pretty good at that. We can do earthquakes. We've already done a lot of damage to this window. Um, the wall hasn't sustained any damage, but we've already broken the glass. Um, yeah, and, and you check, you know, you do that earthquake movement and then you check to see whether it's still weathertight. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, if it survives that, you might have yourself a job. We're in a perfect storm. We don't have enough houses to house every Kiwi. And the houses that we do have housing Kiwis are unhealthy. The good news is we've discovered some Kiwi ingenuity that might well be able to take the 1.8 million homes in Aotearoa that are currently got people like my grandma living in an unhealthy environment and make it healthy. It's a normal day in Wellington, 27, 30 kilometres an hour that's of wind that's pressure. That's a gentle breeze. Yeah. Any heat that you've put into the building is actually being blown out the other side of the building. Well. So should we turn some water pressure on? Can we see? I want to see what happens with the water. Is this the one in a hundred year storm that you promised oh, me? Oh no. No, no. This is a maybe 25, 30 kilometres an hour wind. There's water on that cladding, but the wind is driving it up through the cladding. So this is what's happening in my grandmother's house at the moment. Why is it not happening there? Well, that's where we've added some layers on the outside. So that's that blue layer blue that layer, you showed me. Blue layer, weather tight, then insulation, then new cladding. Gotcha. That's remarkable, isn't it? That's just an average wet day. Yeah. Being at Oculus today has been awesome because what I've seen is they're not just researching. They're not just writing another paper to say this is what should be done. They're actually doing what they're saying they should do and testing it to make sure that if people like me and you are going to invest into improving the health of their home, it actually is going to make a material difference to the very people that we're wanting to protect. This is how we can take the 1.8 million houses in this country, so many of them are making us sick, and make them healthier. And it's achievable. It's actually affordable.
So as the sun sets on this epic adventure, remember we set out to answer a few simple questions. Simple, but what I realise is definitely not easy. Is it possible to live in homes that keep us healthy? And is it possible to improve the homes that we currently live in? The simple is the answer is yes. Easy, it's a lot more complex than that. And the reason it's a lot more complex is because you guessed it, humans are involved. Not just you and me that live in the homes, it's the sector, it's the industry, it's the whole ecosystem in New Zealand. Our culture, the attitudes that we have towards our homes, for some reason, we've normalized being cold in winter and being hot in summer. That in itself needs to change because until it does, you or I are not gonna walk into a house and be willing to pay for health over a fancy kitchen. So as we move forward, if nothing else, I hope that you look at your home with health in mind. The purpose of a home is to keep us healthy. If it's not doing that, then we are doing ourselves a huge injustice. Healthy homes should not be a dream. They need to be a Kiwi reality. And so it's gonna be you and I that are gonna push that through. Thank you, thank you so much for coming on the journey with Asthma New Zealand. It's been an incredible privilege. We've learnt so much and we hope that this journey makes a difference, not just to our community, but to all Kiwis. Ka kite anō.